My name is Rachel Childers, and I'm a graduate from the State University of New York at Buffalo's Patricia H. and Richard E. Garman Art Conservation Department. Today I'll be presenting a portion of my master's project, the technical study and conservation treatment of an estimated 16th century portrait of a woman, a lady now in blue. I'll be focusing my talk on the investigation of blanched paint film through confocal microscopy, followed by testing various varnish resins to reduce the visual impact caused by the blanching. The painting, entitled Portrait of a Woman by an Unknown Artist, was brought into the Garment Art Conservation Department labs at SUNY Buffalo State in 2017 by a private owner who, unfortunately, had no information as to its provenance. The painting had several aesthetic and structural issues, mostly stemming from previous invasive restoration campaigns. I've broken my presentation down into four categories. First, I'll be discussing the painting's overall condition, as well as the past restoration campaigns the structural treatment procedure and discoveries made during varnish and overpaint removal. Next, I'll present the findings from confocal microscopy analysis. And lastly, the final steps in the treatment, summary of project and areas of future research. Prior to starting the treatment, the painting was thoroughly examined to assess the overall condition concerns. During this process, evidence of several previous restoration campaigns were discovered. Some were more obvious than others. The discolored varnish is noticeable in visible light as a brown haze throughout the composition. The figure appeared to be of religious significance, even if its current condition prohibited the viewer from seeing any religious iconography as the paint had suffered significant abrasion and further obscured by layers of varnish and overpaint. As seen here in ultraviolet induced visible fluorescence, the varnish layer was applied thickly overall, then selectively reduced in the face and hands, leaving a thin layer and exposing the bright palette that make up the skin tones. A digital x-radiograph of the painting was produced, allowing several hidden aspects of the composition to become apparent. The first is the halo sitting, uh, surrounding the sitter's head, seen just here. Next is the area around the sitter's hand. While possibly related to her shawl, forms of radio-opaque paint uh, located in the area just past her thumb, resembles chain links. Here I've highlighted the region that I believe indicates the presence of rosary beads or a chain. The most apparent thing to note is that the areas that exhibit slight distortion in specular and raking light were in fact areas of old fill material. As you can see in these contrast-adjusted cutouts, they appear slightly wavy. That pattern indicates that the fill material has a composition on top meaning that in one of the past restoration campaigns, another painting was cut into pieces and used as fill material in areas of loss, creating, essentially, a painting within a painting. On to treatment, the initial steps include grime and varnish reduction, followed by reduction of the overpaint and fill material. Next, the painting was structurally stabilized through an edge lining. The dirt and grime layer were reduced using trimonium citrate applied with hand-rolled cotton swabs, and cleared with deionized water. Next, the varnish was, was reduced using isopropanol. During that time, I uncovered areas of blanched paint as well as paint canvas uh, fills that were obscured by the thick layer of varnish as well as the overpaint. Here's the painting after varnish and overpaint reduction. You can now see the extent of the damages. There was an uneven and brittle fill material in the areas of loss, specifically along the proper right side of the face and throughout the perimeter. This was reduced uh, revealing more of the original composition. So here's the painting after the fill material was mechanically reduced. The glue paste lining was found to be structurally sound and supported the painting within the image area, therefore it was decided to not remove the old lining. However, the nails along the tacky margins corroded the secondary support, resulting in areas of loss under the nails that held the painting to the stretcher. The nails were removed and the canvas was edge lined. I chose umbrella for the edge lining as it had appropriate thickness and strength necessary for the painting. As seen in this top left image, the edges were thinned and cut using pinking shears, then the strips were adhered to the canvas using a heated spatula and viva film. Next, the next step was to apply a varnish layer to act as a barrier between the original material and the retouching media, as well as saturate the areas of blanching to the extent possible. The cause of blanching in paint film is a phenomenon that is still lacking conservation scholarship. One theory is that solvent absorbs into the body of the paint during cleaning, 
and solubilizes a component of the paint film, such as free fatty acids, metal soaps, waxes, or their degradation products, and then through both capillary and mechanical action, it's leached out, leaving microbubbles. Here you can see an example of this phenomenon in a sample of paint film from a 2015 study. The surface is swollen due to the presence of these microbubbles, which then turn into microvoids once dry. Extensive testing was done to determine which varnish would best saturate out the blanching in the robes. Initial testing involved brush application of several varnishes in the areas of blanching, including B72, Laripol, and Rigores, with and with a Wout Craton, a varnish additive that improves elasticity and acts as a mattifying agent to the typically shiny resin. Damar was also tested as a low molecular weight varnish with low viscosity. These positive aspects of Damar outweigh the fact that it does cross-link over time, but based on these tests, Rigores without Craton and B72 and Xylene were found to be the most successful. So in order to get a better understanding of blanching and its interactions with varnish, the painting was examined using confocal microscopy. To do this, I worked with director and professor Patrick Ravines. Along with performing conservation imaging for the initial condition assessment, the painting was examined using several analytical methods at SUNY Buffalo State in order to better understand the material makeup of the original composition and materials used in the restoration efforts. This presentation focuses on the use of confocal microscopy as it provided new insight into the phenomenon of blanching, as well as provided the most valuable information that aided in carrying out my treatment. Before I proceed, I want to give a brief warning that the video on the next slide shows flashing lights, so if you're sensitive to that, I advise looking away now, and I'll let you know when you can resume watching. Convocal microscopy measurements were collected using NanoFocus NuSurf Explorer equipped with a 10x objective and an 11 millimeter working distance. The confocal system produces a three-dimensional view of the blanched surface area that could further analyze using uh, NanoSurf software, which collected profiles across the surface. We took measurements of the surface topography of several areas of blanching before and after testing. For those who looked away, you can resume watching the presentation. So here's what the monitor looks like during a measurement. Over a thousand images of the surface are captured in incremental focal planes. The confocal software stacks the images and generates maps depicting the surface topography. The texture you see is a combination of the natural texture of oil paint, as well as the rough blanched regions. This slide is really interesting in that it shows that optical properties are a distinct and separate phenomenon that from the topography of the painting surface. In the left image, the optical properties of the painting surface are observed and recorded by a black and white confocal bright field image. The topography of the painting surface is shown in the top right image by a two-dimensional contour plot of the XYZ and the three-dimensional data in false color, whereas blues indicate depths and valleys, and the greens and yellows are mid-range, and the reds and whites are peak elevations. The black and white uh, bright field image has been overlaid over a three-dimensional topography, yielding the bottom right image, which provides the visual distinction between topo topographic and optical properties such as reflection. While the three-dimensional images provide a great visual of the surface topography, the profiles helped analyze the subtle variations in height, depth, and the combination of the two. Several areas of blanching and unblanched paint were measured and compared. The most informative measurement was taken from a single island of crackler that exhibited blanching on half of its painted surface, seen here in red. The graph on the right shows the profile of the island of crackler across the picture plane, so similar to a cross-section um, going across the x-axis here. The data begins at the red star in the blanched region and continues across the crackler, and you can see, see that same path on the bottom left image here. The area that dips near the center of the profile here corresponds to the edge of the blanching here in the bright field. This shows that the area of blanch is indeed raised. In visible light, the area of blanching resembles a hard white crust over half of the surface. These profiles also show regular repeated dips, which indicate the presence of deep chasms on the surface. These dips were found in all of the profiles extracted from the areas of blanching, indicating it could be a footprint of blanching, which is a surface phenomenon. 
So while shallow dips were found in areas of unblanched paint film, the regularity and wider openings of the chasms were solely found in areas of blanching. Varnish tests were done using 20% Regal Res and Shell Cell D38. Bright field images and false color maps were generated to show the topographic differences throughout the testing period. And the varnish was applied by brush in an area of two inch by two inch region until the blanching was visually saturated. This took six applications. The first coat of Regal Res showed a visible change as seen in the bright field image here, but there appears to be little to no change topographically. The profiles revealed that those regular repeated dips in the blanching were slowly filling, which would account for what we're seeing optically, uh, that the blanching was slowly saturating out with each application. However, there was little difference in the other regions until a 10% B72 was brush applied over the Regal Res to even the surface sheen. We saw from tests so far that Regal Res is successful but requires multiple coats. We decided to test an area using a higher concentration in the hopes that a single brush application would suffice. So this is the area prior to application. And here it is after a single coat of 40% Regal Res in Shell Cell D38. Overall, the low molecular weight um, synthetic resin was able to optically saturate out the blanching almost entirely. Testing these various treatment methods um, was incredibly beneficial in determining which would best address the blanching present, but in the end, 20% Regal Res without Craton won out. Moving on to the final stage of the treatment, the painting required significant filling and retouching. Past restorations and harsh cleaning resulted in an irregular and blanched surface, which was visually reduced through the application of the Regal Res varnish. To give the overview, here is the painting before treatment. I've also included two detail images, one of the sitter's proper right eye and the other of the extended hand. Here it is after the varnish and overpaint were reduced. It revealed the significantly blanched surface. And here's the painting after reducing the uneven and failing fill material. Here's the painting after 20% solution of Regal Res was brush applied overall, and then the painting was left for two weeks so the varnish could fully settle into the surface. In this side-by-side -side view, the overall saturation of the paint film can really be seen. In the more concentrated areas of blanching along the shoulder tops and along the bottom of the composition, the paint absorbed the varnish and now appears matte. At this stage, it was decided to proceed with the filling and apply a secondary isolating varnish layer as necessary during the retouching phase. The fill material um, used in the area of loss was Beva 371 with phenolic resin and dry pigment. This was heat set into the losses using a heated fine tip pen. The surface of the fill material was textured using a heated spatula and a silicon mold taken from the surface of another painting was with similar traction crackle was used. An initial layer of gouache was applied over the fill material matching the color with the imprimatura. In painting became quite a challenge for this painting, particularly in the hand. Once the painting was varnished, it became more apparent that the robe was painted around an extended finger, though no paint is present. As you can see here in this detail extracted from the infrared, uh, reflected infrared image, the ring finger appears to end at the first joint and fold in, so it was decided to leave this area when in painting. And here's the painting after in painting and a final spray application of B72 and xylene to even the surface sheen throughout. Testing was done on pieces of coroplast on how to avoid the orange peel effect seen when applying sympathetically soluble varnishes over one another. I marked out the distance on the floor and set the appropriate pressure on the spray gun. I hope to continue my research to better understand the surface phenomenon of blanching as well as its interactions with varnish and solvents. Thank you to Fiona for being so incredibly supportive, dedicated, and patient. To Patrick for the countless hours you spent with me doing confocal microscopy and to the entire SUNY Buffalo State Garmin our conservation faculty and staff for your unwavering support for the generous foundations who have supported me throughout my time at Buffalo State, and to my classmates, the class of 2020, and thank you all for listening.